Strap in. Hold on to your balls. Women, cover your ears. This is a very, very special episode in the life of my show here in Liberation Republic Public Eye. This is episode 20. But wait, it's a little bit more than that. We have a special guest. We have the one, the only, the greatest man to have ever lived. Well, maybe a slight exaggeration, but he's fucking awesome. Uh, he is from A Voice for Men. Scratch that, founder of A Voice for Men. We have Mr. Paul Elam. Hey guys, Sad Abroad of Liberation Republic Republica, coming to you from the Voluntary Virtues Network, brought to you by the great Michael Shanklin. So, okay, a little backstory about how this miracle happened to me. Uh, I was, you know, doing my overnight shifts like I do at the hotel on Saturday night, and browsing through some articles on A Voice for Men, because, you know, I'm looking to find some content for my show on Wednesdays. And I had nothing. No guests, no friends willing to pop on, and I was running out of time. I was getting frustrated. So... Yeah, I'm browsing through, and then simultaneously on my phone, I see a thing about Domestic Violence Awareness Month uh, through a page that uh, a voice for men shared. So I was like, hey, shot in the dark. Let's go to their contact page, see if there's anybody in the organization who's willing to do a quick interview. I had no idea I would get Paul so quick. I sent my message at 5.45 in the morning. You know what time I got a reply back? 6.52, just a little bit over an hour. Even Norman Horn and John Payne, both great guys, a lot of fun to work with, it took them a day and a half to get back to me. Paul was right there on it. Uh, so needless to say, I almost shit myself when I got my response. Uh, so, okay, enough fanboying. I toyed with the idea of reading a short bio that I threw together based on your About Me page, but I realized I wouldn't do you any justice. So, Mr. Elam, feel free to introduce yourself, give a little background, and... We could probably start with, uh, how did you get into the whole men's rights idea? So, fire away. Well, first, Adam, thanks a lot for having me uh, here. I'm enjoying very much talking to you already. Uh, it is, it, it's nice to have a fan club. I usually have a, a Tommy gun or, or a, a row of people with them who want to speak with me about my ideas. Um, so I really do enjoy it from time to time, sitting down in a congenial, open environment where people are ask, actually asking real questions, wanting real answers. I mean, and that is for the mainstream, uh, has become taboo. Uh, they predetermine what they want to write, they ask enough questions to get by, and then they go ahead and write what they're going to write. Um, how did I get into A Voice for Men? How did I get, or you asking me, how did I get into the men's movement? Yes, sir. I noticed that feminist ideology was fucking retarded and destructive. I saw it in action in the work I did in the mental health field. Uh, everything from stuff as subtle as when we screened clients for intake into a, a drug addiction facility, alcohol and drug addiction, we would query all the women that came in to make sure they had not been the victims of domestic violence. And we similarly queried every male that was admitted to the facility to make sure he had not been beating the crap out of his wife. Never did we ask women whether they were physically abusive toward their partners or their children, and never did we ask men if they had been the victims of domestic violence during the course of their dysfunctional relationships. That, for me, as somebody who considers himself a skeptic and a rational thinker, was a big fucking red flag. Why are we asking this very narrow range of questions based on whatever is between somebody's legs? And why are we determining the course of their treatment, which is a very, very serious matter, based on those answers? I also saw, at the same time, a lot of the shopworm, pop psychology, Phil McGraw kind of uh, stuff. This was back in the day where people like Melody Beatty and Susan Forward and uh, whoever wrote uh, uh, women, Robin Norwood wrote Women Who, Who Love Too Much. Um, all this narrative about how women are these chaste, pure vessels of truth and honesty in the world, delicate petals made of porcelain and that they are crushed systematically and routinely by the men who are a part of a great patriarchal system that does nothing but crush and oppress women. 
And I saw the language of this coming into treatment to the extent that we were actually bringing in outside professionals to take our, our male clients together in groups and tell them what shits they were for being men and that maybe alcohol was a problem for a problem for maybe smoking hundred and fifty two hundred dollars a day in crack was a problem in their lives but what they really needed to pay attention to was who they were as men and how they were treating women I watched all this happen over a, the course of a period of years right in front of my eyes and I naturally, I, I think part of it is a function of, of my personality, part of it is a function of being a skeptic and of actually wanting to help people, started asking, what the fuck are we doing here? What the fuck are we doing with our clients that we are assigning them roles of perpetrators and victims before we know the first real truth about their lives and where they're been? And the amount of pushback I got from that within my own community of treatment professionals was absolutely mind-blowing. The offense that people took, that I might suggest that some of our male clients were actually victims and some of that our female clients were actually perpetrators and that we might be ignoring child abuse by refusing to look at the, the behavior of these people. Even in the professional circles I ran in, the, the backlash from even beginning that kind of dialogue was extreme and from that point on I was a men's rights activist. Ever again. And it's one of those funny things. There's there's all this talk about now in schools, there's some schools who are calling kids purple penguins to get rid of the whole uh, gender bias and they want to kind of go <laughs> genderless pronouns and stereotypes and stuff like that. You know, and really in the medical profession, especially in the psychiatric profession, you need to go on a case by case basis throw the balls and the ovaries out the window. Who cares if they've got a rack on them or, you know, man tits like I've got? Who gives a shit? Treat them for what's going on up there and uh, not what's going on down there. And that seems to be obvious just across the world that that's not happening, uh, which is makes me really glad that you chose to spoke up uh, or chose to speak up. I'm sorry. My brain has completely gone to shit today. Um, it's because I'm a damn patriarchal man and... My dick's doing all the thinking for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, got in the men's rights activist because of your basically of your job in, in the medical profession. Uh, where do your political ties fall? You know, as a network on the Voluntary Virtues Network, we focus on liberty, namely volunteerism and market anarchism. Same vein as Stefan Molyneux, who I know you're very familiar with. Uh, yes, I'd be a terrible, terrible interviewer if I didn't throw you this softball. Where do you lean? Oh, man, I lean toward the idea that every uh, established part of mainstream politics is a bunch of scumbags and liars that I don't believe. That is my actual political take on the matter. If we're talking purely philosophically, I lean libertarian, small l. I lean toward constitutional conservatism. I lean toward, toward literal interpretation of the law and I lean toward s small, excuse me, uh, my bourbon is getting to me here. <laughs> I, must, I must need another sip. I lean toward small unobtrusive government, uh, if any at all. Uh, I do have the belief, now I'm not an anarchist, um, I do believe that there is some remote functions for government, regulating contracts, that sort of thing. Um, I think we could have a government probably 1% of the size that it is now, and we would have a lot less dead people, we would have a, a, a lot fewer people in prison, we would have a lot less people living below the poverty line, we would have a lot less ignorance in our culture. Uh, I certainly believe that, uh, like I said, that government has a function here and there that should be determined with extreme caution by the people who allow them uh, that kind of power. But in terms of a government that tells us what marriage is, what rights are, uh, whether or not we're involved in interventionist wars, whether or not that we're deciding to brown to bomb brown people because they have some uh, crude oil a few hundred yards beneath the surface of their sands 
that's the kind of government that I would really just like to see evaporate. Right, and yeah, you know, I know a lot of my rabid anarchist listeners, and you know, I sometimes fall into that trolley category every once in a while. Uh, guys, we have to ask you to shut the hell up for this episode because this is not the reason we're here. We're here for talking about domestic violence and the men's rights movement. Yeah, you know, we're going to get involved. Was a, that was very personal, little in this talk uh, today. To clarify, <laughs> that was a personal view. I do not right. allow even my own personal views to find its way to the pages of ABFM. We stay apolitical. Um, it, I don't want to thrust my beliefs on anybody. You know why? Because my beliefs are just as faulty as anybody else's. I don't have the answers. Don't pretend to. Now, we do have a lot of people that like to march into our scenario and say, men's rights are a left-right issue. If you vote for Mitt Romney, you would have been better off. Okay, you know, there are, there's nutcases in every crowd, and they do come in on the fringe of things. But our stand is apolitical. We don't give a damn. You're left, right, in between, anarchist, uh, socialist, it doesn't matter. If you're concerned with the issues that are being faced by men and boys in this culture, then there's a place for you at ABFM in many different capacities, and we'd love to have you. Right, and it's just one of those perfect little segues into my next question. It's almost like I wrote this out, almost. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I've obviously got my personal biases being an anarchist, so I could be seeing through those kind of rose-colored glasses, but it seems to me when I'm looking through the pages, looking through the comments, and even look through looking through some of the outlets that are a little bit farther off from A Voice for Men, you know, I'm seeing a lot of libertarian and anarchist men more so than I'm seeing, you know, Republicans, Democrats, or you know, authoritarians or those in power. Do you see the same things that I do? Absolutely do, and I think that, that there is very, very sound reason for that. Uh, the issues that we address, like the egregious amount of destructive power in our family courts, uh, what's going on in California with, with, with insane legislation like yes means yes, uh, uh, the, the, the stuff that is, once you look at it closely, you realize how mentally ill these approaches are. The, the, the star chambers that are going on on our college campuses that are handling what should be criminal matters uh, and determining the outcome of people's academic futures based on somebody uh, having one too many Jack Daniels and then being sorry about having had sex in the morning. Next thing you know an academic career is destroyed. This is going on all the time. There are now coalitions of attorneys that are writing our Senate and saying, hey, what the fuck are you people doing? You, this, is, this is crazy. You're destroying the Bill of Rights, you're destroying due process, and you're doing it all under the auspices of protecting women that really don't need your protection in this way. Um, so the fact that that's going to attract more libertarian, uh, more, more true conservative uh, men like in small or no government, anarchists, things like that, I'm not surprised at all. I think there's good reason for that, and I think that those people bring a level of discourse and intelligence to the conversation of the issues that we're discussing that we never get from mainstream left versus right, the, the whole comic book story of how George Bush is really different than Barack Obama, my ass, uh, but people that believe that don't bring much to our conversations. The anarchists, the, the true libertarians, the people that are out there on the fringes looking at the evils of government and what it does in the lives of the average person, those people bring some damn good stuff to our pages. Right, and uh, you know, it's such a, a wide uh, array of, of things to talk about too. I mean, there's everything from talking about the whole white privilege bullshit and how, or the male white privilege especially, and how we've got it so good because we've got a, a white sack down between our legs, but well, it's really just all nothing but shenanigans. So we see groups like Manosphere pop up and uh, all over Reddit you've got the red pill. Uh, do you think groups like Manosphere or red pill hurt the cause? Because I find in some cases I might not agree with them. I, sometimes they're a little bit more insightful uh, you know, by inciting more rage, I think, than even you get sometimes, and you have the wonderful propensity of bringing a lot of hate to you for stupid-ass reasons, uh, but these guys seem to be a little bit more trolly sometimes. 
Well, if there's what's your take on those guys? If there's somebody's out there talking about these issues that is getting more rage from me, I'd like to list their names because I need to have them <laughs> assassinated. Um, I won't have people being the subject of more anger than I am. That's one of the most prideful things in my life. But do I think <laughs> these guys are doing good things? Hell yes, they're doing good things. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, I think that, that Roosh's website, uh, I forget the name of it, Roosh V Forums, I, I, I think it's all about pickup artistry, uh, definitely what most would call a, a member of the manosphere. I think it's one of the biggest loads of crap in the world. I think it's what it is is selling the idea that um, insecure men can emulate some real good looking uh, 3% body fat muscular alpha alpha dude with the right lines and that they're too going to have every hot woman in the world lined up for them. It's playing off people's insecurities. However, that being said, the information that Rush publishes and that is part of the discussions on his site is very critical in the right ways to the paradigm that young men now live in. And it points out really, really good information. So while I think there's a lot of dog and pony show going on there to sell books or whatever, at the same time, uh, I'm not going to argue with 90% of the information that I see on there. The only thing I differ with is that I think that making women the focus and center of your life, that you shape your personality and your behavior and everything about your life in order to be appealing to women, I think is kind of a dumb message. But he is pointing out to people what they should be rejecting. Another great example is Return of King. It's a very high, tra high traffic website. Um, I personally think there is no return to kings. Kings were like, you know, 10 guys, <laughs> and then there's the rest of us. <laughs> and we're not going to get a return to kings for the rest of us. That being said, great information, great perspectives on that site that is worth listening to. I think all these things help because they are providing an alternative to the just the utter bullshit that is being fed through the mainstream media, uh, what are what are men getting from the mainstream media? They get Bill Bennett and Kay Heimowitz saying "man up." Uh, they get he for he for she. They get uh, you'll be a better man if you take care of women. Uh, forget about you and your problems. Just worry about women. That's equality. Equality is half of the human race throwing away any interest in their own issues and tending to the needs of the other half. That's their version of equality. And so as long as Roosh and Return of Kings and other websites like that, Spearhead, others are putting out counter theory that is discrediting that and showing men a different way to look at themselves and to look at life, I think they're gold. I think they need to keep going strong, and I'm totally supportive of what they're doing, even if I don't agree with a lot of the rhetoric. Yeah, very good. And we're gonna. I've got one question from a, a faithful listener. Uh, he's choosing to stay anonymous for his own silly reasons. Um, but I want to take a stab at this question for you. It's uh, he asked, uh, "Do all women have some evil nature that will turn them into sluts if freedom and Western civilization come their way, as some of the red pill folks claim, uh, or is that just a load of crap?" Uh, I think all human beings have a streak of, of evil in their nature that will turn them into total pieces of shit unless they have a moral barometer that stops that from happening. Uh, I'll make it clear, and I have, I've tried to a thousand times, a lot of times people don't get it because of the nature of our work. This is not a gender war for me. This is not men versus women. This is not women are bad and men are good. That is a bigoted short-sighted, myopic point of view, in my opinion, that leads us nowhere. Are there women that are tend toward hypergamy, which is not exactly a very healthy thing for men? Yes, lots and lots and lots of them. And guess whose responsibility it is not to connect with women like that? It's men's. Uh, there are women who are fair-minded. There are women who do want to bring something positive to relationships with men. There are women that are good, decent, outstanding human beings. Um, 
if you can't find one, it's because you're not screening out the dead weight. Uh, women have been encouraged to screen out potentially dangerous men forever, and we've seen that taken to extremes. Like I read an article once four or five years ago; it was hysterical. And in the same article, it says, "Beware of men that bring you flowers." And then later, in the same article, it says, "Beware of men that don't bring you flowers." Uh, <laughs> sorry, but we're not going down that road of stupid <laughs> in how we evaluate. Um, uh, I guess they want to bring cactuses. Yes, cactus, <laughs> cactus flower, and then have a fucking seat on it. Um, uh, and that's what you'll get in a lot of relationships, unfortunately. Do we urge men to be cautious with the kind of women that they get involved with? You better friggin' believe we do, uh, because the wrong woman can and will destroy your life, period. Uh, and I mean all of it, for the rest of it, not just for a few years or a few months. She will destroy you as a human being for the remainder of your existence on this planet if you choose the wrong one. And getting men to get this message is much more difficult than getting women to get it. I, I talked to a man not too long ago. I swear to God, this is the truth, that it's just mind-blowing. He had been burned two times in a row in relationships by women he had picked up in titty bars. But he was telling me that he found the right girl from a titty bar, that this girl he had just met from the titty bar made her living squatting down and picking up folded dollar bills with the cracks of her ass, um, was the right one. She was really a good person. She was really a decent human being, and he thought they had a real future together. I mean, what can you do but what the fuck? Okay, dude, good luck. Talk to you later. Um, as long as men, and too many men do have that kind of mentality, they're going to have problems with hypergamous women. They're going to have problems with the real bitches in the world until they get a sense of their own values, their own worth, and what they'll put up with and what they won't put up with in a woman, then they're going to be vulnerable. And to sit here and blame that on women is stupid. And, you know, I personally have gone through the whole white knighting phase too, which I think is a lot of what this this guy you're talking about suffers from. You know, trying to save them from their shitty situation of being a hooker, of being a stripper. I'm sorry, a dancer. Uh, you know, I had a couple of crazies that I had dated throughout the years, and thankfully I had one shipped off to job corps, so I never have to see her crazy ass again. Uh, but I finally found one that, you know, she is completely secure in everything she does. She is completely independent in that. You know, she's got her own jobs. I mean, I'm recording in her freaking apartment because uh, my house is too damn loud. Uh, and it's the most loving relationship I've ever had. Yeah, we have our squabbles, mostly due to budgets and crap. But, you know, that's minor stuff. At the end of the day, it's all fun. You know, we, we love each other. And uh, I, I for sure see some good things down the road, assuming she doesn't walk off. Because uh, <laughs> I don't walk away from shit like this. Um, and, and she might. It's, it's uh, and, and even if she does walk off, you have statistically a much better chance that she's going to walk off with her own shit and not a few pickup loads of yours waving bye-bye, see you later, sucker. Yup. And that's why we've been... I mean, we've talked the whole marriage game for a while, but... Uh, we're waiting until it's more financially feasible to get that lavish wedding, uh, and we'll, we'll see if we last. I think we will. I hope we will. I, in fact, I, I know we will, uh, unless she gets some kind of brain tumor so from her feminist friends uh, who have been cutting off from her slowly but surely when they realize, she realizes they're retarded. Um, which kind of brings me to the next question. Uh, despite huge amounts of evidence of that this so-called patriarchy doesn't really exist, or in any meaningful way, mind you, uh, that, you know, why has this become the cornerstone of their philosophy, and why have they become so rabid, these feminists, and so vicious? I mean, they threatened to, what, kill you and bomb your, your conference out in Detroit. Why has it become so rabid in the last 20 years? Uh, it actually, believe it or not, has been rabid a lot longer than that. Uh, we find instances of arson, uh, th uh, murder plots, threats to murder, going all the way back to the suffragette movement in the mid-1800s. 
uh, uh, that carried through 40 years ago. Erin Pitsy, the woman who started the battered women's shelter movement in England in 1971, uh, uh, did a lot of research on the on the women that she worked with, and she found out beyond any doubt whatsoever that most of the women that she was protecting in her shelter were as violent or more violent than the men they were supposedly running from. She was stalked and harassed. At one point, a strange package showed up on her door. Of the bomb squad had to be called. Somebody shot her dog. She was threatened with death many, many times to the point that she literally had to, to run out of her own country. She came to the United States for years um, and continued her work uh, and eventually felt comfortable enough to return to England. Uh, but the idea of feminist-inspired violence and threat narratives and the, the use of force and coercion and intimidation to silence people that are their critics, nothing new at all. Been around for a long time. Uh, we're hearing a lot more about it recently because we have the Internet. And we have places like A Voice for Men that just won't shut up about this stuff, uh, which I think is, is a really good thing because we do need to show the world we're not talking about dealing with a movement that is looking for equality. We're talking about dealing with a bunch of, of ideological thugs that will intimidate, browbeat, and, and threaten violence on anybody who dares to speak in dissent of their ideas. That's what we're, these are brown shirts, and that's all they are. Right, and it's, it's one of those things that, you know, this whole the the feminists being more violent and we're now seeing cops becoming shown more and more violent and you know shooting dogs left and right uh, unfortunately a lot of that we're finding out a lot about uh, about it more so because of the internet which is a great thing but a bad thing too because uh, you know, in one way it's good because we can finally start to nip it in the butt a little bit more hopefully uh, but the problem is now we look back how much have we missed you know if we had this technology even ten years ago you know, how much more of this could have been stopped or prevented or at least covered to where, I mean, there was a, a police force where the entire force got shut down. I mean, there were like three good officers in, well, <laughs> good officers in that whole crew. that didn't get caught. <laughs> yeah, that either didn't get caught or, you know, finally stepped over that thin blue line. And, you know, we're not seeing any of that crossing the thin red menstrual line from some of these feminists calling out their own bullshit. Uh, you know, this kind of goes back to the cycle of violence. You know, obviously, Stefan Mollen, you and yourself has done, you guys have done some amazing work on this. And we'll throw these facts and throw these facts and throw these facts out at these feminists. Is it just because women are so emotionally retarded uh, that they're not getting it and that they're not latching onto these facts? What is the reason that we aren't getting through to them? And is there another strategy that we can? Do you see any way that we can? Oh, yes, and we are. Uh, if you look at the editorial staff of ABFM, if you look at the speakers at our conferences, you'll I mean, you're, there's women crawling all over the place. This is not really about women, so to speak. Now, there is, if we're going to be fair, uh, I wrote an article not too long ago called The N Percent. I suggest that people uh, check that out on the website and take a look at the rules that we live by that uh, involve both men and women. And I laid out some, some general premises that I called laws. And I use that term figuratively. These are not scientific laws. Obviously, none of this can explain all people how they'll react. But in general, I think they're very um, accurate. One, when it comes to men, men will not oppose anything that they perceive to benefit women. Now, it, it doesn't matter whether it actually benefits women. It doesn't even matter if it actually harms women. But if the perception of something is that it benefits women as a whole, men as a whole will support it, and they will attack and destroy other men who oppose it. That is a, a fact of human nature. Women, on the other hand, will not oppose anything that is perceived to benefit women as a group, even if that particular thing actually harms women as a group. As we're seeing now, women have not made gains from leaving the home as an environment and going into the workplace and becoming corporate clones that sit there 
missing their children with bags under their eyes, showing up, doing the commute every day, dragging their ass into middle-of-the-road jobs that barely pay their bills. But as long as we can sell them on the idea that that's empowering, they'll buy it. And they have been. Uh, so we have to look at how much this feminist message plays into human nature. Men want to protect women. They'll do it at any cost. They'll white knight at any cost, uh, even to the point that we have white knights for Jody Arias after she shoots a guy in the head, stabs him 32 times, and slashes his throat from ear to ear. There are men and women out there saying, poor dear. That's how nuts we are as a culture about protecting women. But uh, are women catching on to this? Yeah. Uh, there is a, a, we saw this thousands of women standing up saying why they don't need feminism uh, in that uh, remarkable campaign. Uh, that isn't something we did. That's something a bunch of women got together and said, I'm tired of being portrayed a victim. I'm tired of being portrayed like I'm a baby, like I'm incompetent, like I can't do anything for myself, and fuck y'all. And they held up signs saying as much. Um, we see women all over ABFM that have become really iconic spokespersons for these issues. So it's happening. But do most women want the free ride? Yeah, they do. Um, and it's just incumbent on men to quit giving it to him, quit giving it to him. And it's incumbent on women to tell their sisters, nobody owes you shit. And, Go out and earn it. Right, right. And I think that's something that, you know, if there were less fatherless households, uh, this would probably be prevented. I misplaced those statistics when I printed up 34 pages of article stuffs from your guys' website uh, last night. Um, I decided I left those out for whatever reason. Uh, but I remember there was, you know, reports that, you know, of the fatherless homes, you know, somewhere around 70-80% get into drug use, uh, and, you know, crime goes up exponentially, uh, the chances of having teenage pregnancies or, you know, pregnancies out of wedlock, uh, or just any of those things that, generally speaking, are bad things uh, and things that are indicators for a poor lifestyle for the next generation, uh, we see this running rampant. And I, it could be that a lot of these feminist women just have these daddy issues. I, I could be just painting that with a broad brush. I'm not sure. Um, is there any link to uh, you know, childhood trauma or lack of fathers or lack of a, an active quality father uh, for these feminists? Or is that just too general of a statement? I don't think it's too general. I think if, if we start digging, and I have dug into the lives of some prominent feminists and gone back and, and looked, I haven't found a strong father-daughter connection in, in virtually any of them. Um, and what you said is also very important. We need to keep in mind that by every psychosocial stress factor or function, matter of functioning, that we measure the life of young people, particularly from adolescence on, whether or not it's uh, uh, early pregnancy, drug abuse, truancy, uh, suicide, uh, school failure, uh, anything you can name that we measure the quality or the functionality of a young person's life is drastically affected by fatherlessness. It is, I mean, it's, uh, I would suggest people get the book by Warren Farrell called Father and Child Reunion. It's an extremely well-researched book, and it will absolutely blow your mind on just how many of these problems from gang involvement to committing murder to raising and becoming a part of dysfunctional families in the future where children are abused, fatherlessness over and over and over. They go to any prison and ask the population of inmates, how many of you grew up with a stable father in the home? And be prepared to be sickened by the, the lopsided nature of the responses. Yes, I think feminism is a, a personality disorder in and of itself, and part of it is fostered by not having a positive male influence growing up for young women and that they are acting out their raids from that on all men uh, by adopting an ideology that demonizes all of us. I think that's plain and simple. Uh, I don't think there's any exaggeration or stretching it takes to get to that conclusion. 
And also, to be completely clear for those who like to read between lines or think that this guy is saying more than he really is, uh, while feminism in itself could be a, a, a personality disorder, like you said, uh, white, like, male supremacy is also similarly a, a mental disorder where they clearly didn't have a positive woman role model, a, a good mother or grandmother or something to that effect in their lives. So or let's make positive, that abundantly or, fucking clear. <laughs> yes, or, po or a positive male. Uh, the impact, if you look at the statistics, you find that uh, children that are raised in single-parent homes run by fathers do just about as well as two-parent homes. I know that, 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 that people don't like this, but I'm just talking about the evidence. I'm just talking about the statistics. Children raised by single, in single-parent homes that are just mothers at risk across the board, many, many maladies, many, many problems. Uh, if you want to draw from that that fathers are better parents, fine. That's not the conclusion that I'm making. I'm thinking that we would see a difference in those statistics, too. If family courts were fair in distributing custody uh, on, based on merit, based on worthiness, instead of based on having a vagina or a penis, then we would probably see some changes in the numbers. Because right now, what we get raising our children are cream of the crop fathers. Their mother's just about have to go into the courthouse smoking crack in order to lose custody. Uh, so we get the very best of fathers, naturally I think that uh, for single fathers, and that naturally will turn out some better results. And I think those results would probably even out some if they were distributed evenly between men and women. They're not, however. Uh, but yes, uh, do I think that, that some of the, the fringers in our movement, um, and we do have them, uh, that believe that all women are cunts and are evil and uh, that the only solution in life is to totally stay away from women. I think these are guys that had bad families and then quite possibly really life upsetting circumstances like losing their children in family courts for no good reason uh, and uh, other really, really negative aspects of their lives have shaped the way they think about women instead of shaping the way they think about society. And there is a huge difference there, and I always try to urge those guys that if you think women are the problem all by themselves here, that this whole clusterfuck we have of a, a gap between the genders and all the animosity and all the politics behind it is just because women did something, then I don't think you're thinking through the problem very well. Well, to be entirely uh, truthful, though, if you're a Christian man, uh, wasn't it Eve that really kind of kicked shit off? Of course I jest. Uh, being a pastor's kid myself, I know that that is a shitty argument, but still fun to make every once in a while. Damn well, Eve. <laughs> uh, Eve is probably the only reason I would become a Christian. Just kidding. Uh <laughs> But being a skeptic, uh, I, I don't, I, I don't, and believing that the Bible was written by men with their own ideas, I kind of read into that whatever you will. Uh, I do agree, yes, uh, Eve, Eve set the, the path of evil uh, in place for the world. Nothing, none of this would happen if Eve had not eaten the forbidden fruit and, and then used her feminine wiles to tempt Adam. No, seriously. Uh, this is a social problem. It involves both sexes uh, to the fullest degree. It involves complacency in the electric, in the electorate. Uh, it, it involves people who don't want to think past who won the last football game, uh, and they say, "Oh yeah, uh, battered women, bad thing." Okay, move on next. Who's playing Thursday? Uh, that's what we got in this culture. So this is how we end up with this stuff. And last joke before we dig into the domestic violence stuff, uh, I just thought about when you said it, uh, when you said Eve and evil very close together. I wonder where the origin started for the word evil. Huh. That's a conversation for another day. We'll figure that out one day, hopefully. Uh, you know something? That, that's, <laughs> worth, that's worth an essay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about that. He's a pastor. He'll, he can probably point me in the right direction on that. Um, so, I just okay. wonder who Evil Knievel was hooked up with. When he got that thing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, all right. It, it was going to be a stretch, but I think we'll just do a, a fucking basic segue. Uh, it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. 
uh, yeah, completely evil, complete, you know, complete bullshit. Uh, that anybody would hit anybody for any reason other than self-defense, or anybody would kill anybody for anything other than self-defense, or beat your fucking kids, kick your dog, or in one case, a cop choked out a dog and sent pictures and texts to their girlfriend. I think that's a form of abuse too. Uh, you know, we see all these statistics about women getting battered. I've got a, a few here. Uh, Incidents of domestic violence against women occur every 15 seconds in the U.S. That is really fucking shitty. And women, I am sorry that that happens to you. Whether that happens at the hands of women, men, kids, uh, whoever. That is really shitty for you guys. And I, I, I'm incredibly sorry that that happens to you. But that's kind of where my sorrow kind of ends. Um, now women are three times more likely to be killed or seriously injured by their male counterpart than vice versa. Kind of makes sense. The tendency is, again, super generality, that men tend to be stronger. Typically. But again, that's also where that shit kind of ends. While there are a shit ton of women who get battered, more than 830,000 men fall victim to domestic violence each year. A man is a victim of domestic abuse every 37.8 seconds. So just since I started talking about women getting battered, we've had two women get battered and one man, and now probably two and four. That is a fucking epidemic. I mean, Ebola, where we had one guy who got through and he's died, again, really shitty. This is nothing compared to the outbreak of violence. Uh, so these numbers aren't really that insignificant. Uh, in 2001, the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health collected data uh, from healthy... Uh, about the health of a national, uh, nationally representative sample of 14,000 people uh, between 18 and 28, and asked several questions about sexual relationships or romantic relationships in the last five years, and whether they involved violence. Of those relationships, 18,761 to be precise, 76% were nonviolent. Good for you. You guys are not assholes. Um, there were 24% which were violent. Way to go. You guys are assholes. Um, of the 24% that were violent, half of them had been reciprocal and half had not. Reciprocal meaning violence was inflicted by both partners, equally or not, up for debate, who cares. Although men, more men than women, 53 to 49, had experienced non-reciprocal violent relationships, more women than men, 52 to 47, had taken part in ones re involving reciprocal violence. What's most striking is that in committing acts, committing acts of domestic violence, more women than men, 25% women, 11% men, were responsible. In fact, in the 71% of non-reciprocal partner violence instances, the instigator was the woman. And while injury was far more likely when violence was perpetrated by a man, in relationships that featured reciprocal violence, men were injured more often, 25% of the time, and women only 20% of the time. Now, this this article that I pulled up is on avoiceformen.com. I will put that in the description bar below so you can look at all the hyperlinks and see where all of this is quoted. I'm not going to bother citing absolutely everything because we don't have time for that shit. Uh, and Great Britain's Office of National Statistics also showed that while 1.2 million women experienced domestic violence, sorry, 800,000 men did as well. Really sorry. In the UK, men comprise 40% of those who suffer from domestic violence. And what's the answer to that? Uh, yeah, man up. And to kind of round it all out, child abuse, the cycle of violence, where all of this violence begins. Mothers are almost twice as likely to be directly involved in child maltreatment as compared to fathers. That includes neglect, that includes violence, and that includes anything where they're not actually properly taking care of their child or even looking out for them. Need I say more? Does this really come down to the childhood? is, Or is this kind of a chicken and egg comparison? Did the violence happen before the childhood shenanigans started? Or did the childhood shenanigans start? And then that created all of this? Uh, you know, What do you think about that? Is there a case to be made? Oh, I think a lot about that. One, I want to say that, that violence itself is an innate tool in the human repertoire of ways to deal with life. Every human being is capable of violence on some level or another. I don't think there's any disputing that. I, I think also though that violence as a way to solve problems in interpersonal relationships or in intimate relationships is a learned behavior. 
uh, children grow up and they see uh, mom and dad hitting each other, uh, which is the case most of the time. It's mutual combat, and let's not make any mistake about that. Most combat in the home, most violence in the home, is two people going at it with each other. Um, the CDC found that in non-reciprocal violence, 70% of the instigators were women when the violence was one directional. Um, but let's go back to your very first statement where you say that there is violence against women in a home every 15 seconds. One of the things that we have to be very, very careful about is how we're defining that violence. Uh, two things to consider. One, 99% plus of all violence in the home does not result in significant physical harm. It's somebody getting slapped or pushed or uh, swatted with a newspaper or spit at or, or something wrong. We definitely concede that this is dysfunctional behavior. But is this life-threatening? Is this something that is putting somebody in danger? Almost all the time, no. And in many of those cases, couples that engage in mutual combat will be fucking their brains out 20 minutes later for some good makeup sex. That is how a lot of this happens, and we have to acknowledge that. Two, when you say something violent has happened every 15 seconds, we have to factor away that and, 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 and qualify it against the backdrop of what feminist ideologues have defined as violence in the home. And if you look through average websites for battered women's shelters, you will find things like um, he cut you off from credit cards uh, is a form of violence and control in the home. So a guy that is watching his wife spending them into oblivion one day says, no more. I can't afford this. We can't afford this. Our family can't afford this. I'm cutting up the credit cards. And until we're out of debt, you're not spending any more extraneous money. That is abuse. That's a part of your every 15 second abuse. That and about a thousand other things. If a guy raises his voice, if he insists on not having company, that's considered isolating her from her friends. So let's take a little bit of the 15 second and the 38 second thing with a grain of salt and say, how often is really, really serious violence happening in the home? And let's qualify that by saying violence that children witness, because no matter what anybody's going to say, I don't give a fuck. Unless you're really getting hurt, unless you're in the hospital with broken ribs or something like that, the primary victims of domestic violence, regardless of who the perpetrator is, are the children that are in that home witnessing it. They're the ones that are terrified that their families are going to break up. They're the ones that are worried about somebody getting hurt, even if it's not realistic to worry. They're the ones not sleeping. It is their school performance that diminishes because they haven't slept the night before worrying about mom and dad. These are the real victims of, of violence in the home, and those are the ones that I think we should be concerned with. Um, so while the statistics, when we start throwing out things like every 15 seconds, every 30 seconds, yes, they're compelling, they're enough to make you think, but we need, do need to take that a step further and start analyzing family violence in terms of victims of that violence that are actually adversely affected. And that is not always the case. Well, and to kind of piggyback off that, uh, again, I'm going to quote a lot of Stefan Molyneux, I listen to him a lot. Uh, Whenever you see, whenever kids see their parents fighting, first of all, their parents aren't in control. And when a child, you know, three, four, five, seven years old, sees their parents not in control, that is a, almost effectively the same as the parents not even being there at all. And think of the anxiety when the kids have to man up, take control of things, and basically take care of themselves when they have no means to do so. That's fucking traumatizing. And sure the fact is. that this isn't even thought about ever, uh, you know, we're worried about the bruises on this woman's face or the cuts on this guy uh, on his arms or his legs. And like you said, not looking at the children as the real victims, uh, assuming that there is a child in the home, it's, it's delusional, it's mental. Because these children carry these scars much longer than you'll see the cut on the woman's face. Because that woman, she's going to know 
or she should know at that point, to stay away from guys like that and to get out of abusive relationships like that if the guy's the perpetrator and vice versa. If the woman's the perpetrator and the man realizes that she shouldn't go around women like that. But kids, well, they are locked into their situation until typically 16 to 18. They can't get out. They are around it 24-7, 365. How are we supposed to fix that? I don't think it's possible without, you know, creating a, a peaceful parenting environment. Uh, so do you think that peaceful parenting would solve a lot of these issues? Now, Steph says Absolutely. that in a decade or, you know, five years or less, we'd have most of the problems of the world solved. Now, I think he takes creative liberty with that. Uh, what do you think? I think that's extremely creative. Uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if I got I, – and don't get me wrong. I love Stefan. Uh, but I don't think I can subscribe to that. I think we're talking about generational lessons that go back multiple, multiple generations. They're not going to be erased in five years. But I will point out the, the truthfulness of what you're saying. I, I recall a session I did many years ago where I was speaking with a couple, and their young son was there. He was, I guess, 10 or 11 years old. And during the course of the session, everything was calm, and the subject of money came up. And the boy started crying, and I mean uncontrollably. He started crying, and of course we had to stop everything and try to get to what was bothering him. And it turned out that most of the time that his parents came to blows with each other, it was in arguments over money. And he was so traumatized that he could not even hear the word money in the context of his parents without having a breakdown. So it, my question for anybody is who's the victim in that family? Because see, I don't even care who struck the first blow or if even somebody got a bigger bruise than the other adult. That kid was the one that was damaged by what was going on in the home. And he's the one that's going to grow up on likely one or two paths. He's either going to find somebody and beat them up to get his way because that's what was role modeled for him, or he will find somebody to beat him up to get their way. That's generally how people repeat trends. They either become perpetrator or they become victim. Occasionally people become neither, and that's fine, but the tendency is to become one, of, one or two of those things. Um, these parents both needed the crap slapped out of them, in, in my opinion. Um, uh, to get to the root of what the real problem was in that family, which was not money problems, it was not communication problems, it was two fucking children that decided to, to solve everything by beating each other up in front of their child. Uh, that is like, yeah, that's not a five-year fix, in my opinion. Uh, but it is a fix that we can start on by removing all the hyperbole and drama and histrionics around domestic violence and domestic violence men should never ever hit a woman well you know what there's something about that too I'm gonna to get into for just a second and then let you go on with your questions yes whoever struck first is technically wrong in, in, in an argument whoever initiates the violence is technically wrong but let me just ask people to consider something uh, a man comes home from work every day in which he, let's say he's a garbage collector and he spends all day in the filth, hefting heavy cans, uh, exposing himself to disease, uh, putting up with grueling work in terrible weather because no matter how cold or how hot it is, the trash has got to be picked up. And he gets home and as soon as he walks in the door, he's subjected to the of nagging and being told, that he's inadequate, he doesn't make enough money, he doesn't work hard enough, he doesn't care about his family, he doesn't do this right or that right. And say this goes on for years and years, and one day he snaps and, and slaps the living shit out of his wife. Is he wrong? Sure he's wrong. Is that Does that explain the whole picture of the violence in the home and how it started? No, it doesn't. It doesn't even come close. Uh, uh, I saw but Bill victim Burr. blaming Paul. Victim <laughs> blaming Tom. Yes, I'm, I'm victim <laughs> blaming because there's no reason to ever hit a woman, no matter what. No matter if she spits on you, treats you like a dog, takes all your money and spends it on a guy, 
on her crack habit, on and and then spends the rest of her time telling your only child what a worthless scum bucket you are and how he should hate you. You should still not hit her. Guess what, folks? People are going to hit over stuff like that sometimes, and it is understandable and it is human. And to approach that couple like he's the perpetrator and she's the victim is the biggest fucking mistake made in, in modern psychotherapy and by the domestic violence industry. It's bullshit. We need a better, more nuanced understanding of how violence develops in the home if we're ever going to do anything about it. Right, and you know, where do these, obviously these women learn these sort of tactics from their mothers and the mothers before them and so on, and but also their, their culture around them. You know, how often do you pick up one of those, well, you should probably never ever pick them up, but those bullshit women's magazines saying, you know, how to talk your guy into this, or uh, you see the, the shows like uh, Desperate Housewives or Sex in the City uh, or the Real Housewives of insert bullshit coastal city here. Uh, you know, they're all these catty, bullshit, idiot bitches who are, you know, not only resource hogs and trying to go out and get resources for nothing. Uh, without even earning a damn bit of it. I mean, maybe they're using their tits, which, you know, good for you. Use what the plastic surgeon gave you uh, if it'll get you something. You know, more power to you. Let me just go and get myself a, an enlargement, and then we'll see how the tables turn. Uh, you know, it's it's a lot of learned behavior, and it's sad how many people agree with it. Um, you know, why has this man up phrase become so... A central axiom to society is it because we don't want to go up against the mothers who arguably train us up for the first 12 years of our lives for the most part through elementary school and uh, you know in our household uh, is it because the state has become the father and the husband in the relationship you know as compared to the mother who doesn't need a well-to-do and you know good man uh, is there something I'm missing here what's the link no, I, th I think you've nailed it. I think that men in this culture, particularly in Western culture, are the easiest saps in the world to manipulate with shame. It is, it's pathetically easy. Just man up. Uh, two words. Uh, guy doesn't want a triple shot of tequila. Somebody says man up, he drinks it. Uh, a guy doesn't want to put up with an abusive, cheating, money-grubbing whore of a wife and he complains there will be somebody in his church, somebody in society, somebody in many different places that's going to say, well, it's your job as a man. Just man up and, and deal with it and be a better husband and don't worry about what she's doing. Uh, and men are easy in that way. You can lead them around like dogs. It's one I've always I've regretted. I, I, my profession is one that has basically ruined my political future uh, or professional future uh, I don't have a political future, but it's ruined my professional future. I don't think anybody that Googles me uh, in a in a PR sensitive job is is going to be quite ready to to take me on. Um, and it's all because the mainstay of my work is fuck man up uh, is is sending the message that manning up is an act of getting on your knees. And that's precisely what it is. It's doing what you're told to do by somebody else's impression of what a man is. And men are very vulnerable to this. They, they are raised by mothers that tell them, my little man does this and that. And they're raised by fathers that say, you better man up. They have peer groups going all through middle to junior high to high school to college that tell them man up. And now we've got it all over the Internet in different messages, particularly ironically from feminists telling men to man up. If there was ever a patriarchal message to send somebody, that's it. And the feminists are the prime purveyors now of man up, which ought to be a fucking hint, dudes, uh, that, that maybe man up is not in your best interest. But that's the way it is, and men are just, they're easy. They're, e they're pathetic. They're embarrassing. Uh, it, it really does get to me, but you know, uh, that's sort of what I've elected to do with life is to try to get guys to challenge that a little bit. And, and the feminist man up call is just so hilarious because it's such a paradox in and of itself. You know, we're sick of you being these these 
big bald men and being so manly and uh, her. But you better be a goddamn good man. You better man up. If they just looked at their own retardedness, they would realize that you know even people with an IQ of 65 would kind of realize that the shit is shit, and you better stop smearing it on your face, or else you're gonna get Ebola. I think it'll change once men figure out that the message "man up" is not about being a man. It has nothing to do with being a man. Man up literally translated means do what I want you to do so it will benefit me. That's all man up means. Once you get that in your head, and for admittedly for some guys it's really fucking hard to get that into their head, um, but once you do get an understanding of the idea that man up means get on your knees and do and fetch like a good boy, then it does become easier for men to say, wait a minute, you know, maybe I should just say fuck off. Yeah. yeah, man up, open the door for girls. Man up, pay for all the dates. Man up, go to war. Man up, get on your knees for this dictator. Man up, go and suck, you know, suck the toes of, of this leader. It's a progression that gets so over the top the farther in you go. Wear a white ribbon and and don't don't criticize rape culture because we all know it's true. <laughs> If they knew the rape culture that was in my mind, it would put Fifty Shades of Grey to shame. Oh, ah, yes. Is great. It's another shenanigans for another day. Um, I get the feeling we're going to be very good friends here on this network. I'm going to probably have you back once a month if you'd be up for it. Uh, I would love to come name. back as often as you'd like to have me and uh, would like to also extend an invitation to you uh, to come on to one of the ABFM programs to bring more of your ideas, and then I can turn around and ask you the tough questions. Uh, very good. I'd I'd be looking forward to that, and we'll we'll work something out off air, and we'll run some announcements and have some fun with that. Uh, two more questions, really. Um, one, do you have any resources pages or like recommendations off the top of your head of organizations uh, or or call centers uh, or even specific doctors? Uh, who specialize in in domestic violence or you know battered men, battered women, or you know even probably more so, especially given the the nature of our conversation today, you know child therapists who can help kind of deal with the darkness that is this domestic violence. Don't have a recommendation on child therapists. Um, again, we have the problem that uh, feminist ideology has become such the dominant factor in the mental health industry. Uh, that I mean now if you go through and you look like if you look at your service providers on your insurance and read the bios do a little googling of the, of the therapist or on there you'll go right back to gender studies 99 percent of the time these this is a feminist group of people <laughs> that are interested in the feminist message but I can I'm fortunate to say that um, for men who are experiencing problems either with domestic violence or with shitty, obnoxious, demanding women uh, who have taken over their lives, that they would seek out the services of Dr. Tara Palmatier at shrinkformen.com or Tom Golden, who is an LCSW, a great therapist, a good friend of mine, uh, who is at menaregood.com. Both of them do provide services both uh, in real life and online. Um, should that be workable for you? So yes, we have those people to refer them to, and that group is not likely to grow for a long time. I get emails all the time from therapists that uh, say they would like to help some of the men that come to our site, and then I do research on them and and find how well how well versed they are in patriarchy theory and um, how the Duluth model and how men would be so much better if they only were like women. Um, so we send them back a no thank you and stick with the ones that we have. Uh, if you want to know just general information, if you've ever had a curiosity about what the numbers are, about domestic violence, about sexual assaults, about death rates, about anything and everything that impacts our quality of life, if you go to the masthead of A Voice for Men, on the activism drop down you'll see a page called facts and it is a long meticulously documented 
referenced. We link you right to studies on everything. This is not just people's opinion, but to get an idea of what the lives of men are actually like versus this white male privilege bullshit that's being sold about the internet, like Halloween candy. Um, go to that page and take a look at it, and of course we recommend that you read a lot of the literature there because there's some damn good reading at A Voice for Men. Right, and, and speaking of literature, I'm going to kind of piggyback this one a little bit. Didn't have this planned. Uh, if there were, uh, let's just say, ten books uh, about men's rights issues, about the bullshit of feminism, uh, about domestic violence, whatever, you know, things that can pertain uh, to men in a way that isn't the status quo, isn't this establishment feminist uh, matriarchal uh, society, uh, what would those ten books be, if you happen to know ten offhand? Well, I don't know if I can come up with ten offhand, but I can come off with several. That uh, it, It's just funny that you asked that. Uh, we are in the plans now of developing and launching ADFM Publishing, um, which is a big, big deal that we're just incredibly excited about doing. Uh, within two weeks, there is our first book will be released. It is a book by myself and Peter Wright uh, called uh, Go Your Own Way, Understanding MGTO. And it is about the history, the philosophy, as much as we could pack in in this book about what being a MGTO means without, and I will point this out for some of my more rigid uh, uh, dictatorial uh, cohorts out there. Nowhere in this book do we try to tell you what you must be or not be in order to be a man going your own way. It is a, a list of suggestions and history and uh, you get to call your own shots but I think most people will find that very interesting. It, it's it, There's a copy of the cover on A Voice for Men right now um, on the front page. Uh, you'll see that but that will be launched in a couple of weeks. I have also and I would gather also with the whole MGTOW thing that uh, you probably include a little bit about MGTOW guys who actually happen to interact and have relationships with women too, am I right? Yes, we do. We, oh. What we do is uh, absolutely assert, and I defy anybody to prove us wrong, is that as, as somebody who considers himself, I consider myself a man going my own way, I've been in a relationship for 13 years that is quite stable and that I enjoy very much and that uh, where I'm not assigned to be the one to take out the trash or to pay this bill or that bill. It's actually very possible. I'm living proof of it. Uh, but we also honor a lot of guys that are choosing to eschew relationships altogether uh, and men who want to have them. Uh, this isn't, we're not setting up something as a definitive definition of what you have to be. Uh, we're setting it up so that you can goddamn well choose what you want to be and anybody who tells you otherwise is probably the guy that's full of shit um, and we believe that very strongly also I have a book of my collected uh, uh, articles I picked out 20 of my best articles they are in editing now with some professional editors will be uh, placing a book many of those cover uh, men going in their own way. They also cover general issues of men's rights, issues of domestic violence, things of that sort. I also recommend, got to recommend the classic uh, Myth of Male Power by Warren Farrell. You want a fundamental understanding of all of this shit. Read that book. Uh, you will find uh, Warren gets a reputation of being like the Mr. Rogers of the men's movement because he's so kind and soft-spoken. Read his book and, and see if he doesn't he delivers the message with no sugar coating. He does. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and it's a brilliant book, which is why it's lasted so long. That's available on the front page. The Way Men Heal is another good option by Tom Golden. That's available on the front page. Uh, I am also working on a book right now with Dr. Tara Palmatier uh, that has to, something to do with getting rid of crazy bitches. We'll let you know. Uh, <laughs> and without duct tape and shovels. Uh, uh, those are, uh, though they may be tempting, uh, they are not necessary to say goodbye to crazy, which is the uh, working title of the book. Um, I would suggest also The Manipulated Man by Esther Bilar. Um, you can uh, uh, still get that at Amazon. Uh, she wrote this 35, 40 years ago. 
incredible book, incredible book that really tells men how they're being played and exactly why they're puppets on a string. And uh, she did an, an amazing job in this book. Highly recommended reading. I'd also recommend The Woman Racket by Steve Moxon, uh, uh, another great book. Um, but in the future, uh, within hopefully within just like uh, 30 to 60 days tops, you will see a website launched for ABFM Publishing where we are going to select the very best of the best. Uh, no bullshit's going to get through the filter of what we think are books that will actually benefit men who are going their own way or who are just looking for a different way to approach life uh, than man up. And if I may make a quick suggestion on, on the whole publishing thing, um, if you get the opportunity, uh, do audiobooks for especially the collection of your articles and stuff like that, and either have you read them, Aaron Pitsy, or contract out Stefan to do it, because I would listen to any three of you all day, every day. When I'm doing my overnights at, at the hotel I work at, uh, I'm doing laundry all night because that's part of my job, and uh, I need stuff to listen to. So, yeah, maybe I'm a little bit selfish, but I'm pretty sure other people are on board that it's fun yeah. having some old British guy drone on about shit, but having someone who actually wrote the stuff usually sounds a lot better, especially when they're as awesome as you and Aaron Pitsy and Stefan Molyneux and others. Uh, we would love to hear that, so I don't know if that's already in the works, but I thought I'd throw that, that in the That is a subject that has come up that uh, we have decided to say we're going to do it this way. We're going to first get the publishing down, and right. then after that, we do want to look at audio books because we know they're popular, they're portable, they can be taken in cars, uh, that sort of thing, going a long drive, you could hear. Uh, the better part of a book, and we would love to produce that. Of course, it's a time investment to do it, um, and, a, and a lot of work in editing. However, uh, uh, we're very serious about AVF Film Publishing, and it's hard to imagine doing that without an audio option for people. So I would say the chances are very good we're going to end up there. Very good, and something we ought to keep in mind, guys, this shit ain't free. These guys are pumping out stuff for us, and you know some of which you got to pay for, some of which is free. Go and donate to this bastard right here, please, for the love of God. If you're not donating to him and not donating to several of the other causes that I've recommended to you guys over the last 20 episodes now, uh, you're doing the life wrong, kind of thing. Uh, go and help these guys out, because you know maybe becoming a, a donator or becoming a member or whatever uh, will get you, you know, free this, discounted that. Uh, but also, it'll get you the kind of peace of mind knowing that you're doing the right thing uh, for a movement, for a lifestyle, and for man getting the crazy bitches. Yeah, man <laughs> up and donate, <laughs> goddammit. Uh, so, <laughs> I guess last question is, you've just thrown a couple of bombshells on us with the publishing thing. Is there anything uh, upcoming as far as new conferences, speaking engagements for you or anybody else in part Absolutely. of Absolutely. Uh, uh, I will be at Kennesaw State University on the 1st of November. I'm going to be addressing, uh, for the first time in history, on American soil, a speaker will be coming to a large state-supported institution, and my talk will be on the fraud of rape culture. Um, <laughs> they are, there are many people at Kennesaw very excited that I'm coming there. I mean, I don't know, you can interpret excited any way that you want. <laughs> uh, uh, but also, Karen Strawn will be there speaking, Jonathan Taylor from A Voice for Male Students, and Dr. Janice Fiamingo from the University of Ottawa, who has really done her share getting out there, having people scream at her, shouting her down. But she talks about the fraud of academic feminism in a way that is could be very much on the pages of A Voice for Men. It is that much gloves off. This is going to be a great conference. So that's November 1st at, at Kennesaw State University uh, in Kennesaw, Georgia. Um, it will last all day. It is free. If you're in the Atlanta area, you do not have to pay. All you have to do is come and show up. There's plenty of details on the site. Also, we are in the planning stages for the International Conference on Men's Issues 2015, which will be happening next year. The first one we did in St. Clair Shores, uh, uh, Michigan, was um, a frantic mess and a tremendous success. 
uh, we had an absolute blast there. There are people still floating around on clouds after that experience to have all these people who have been working on these issues for so many years in one place, socializing with each other, doing lectures. Really great, and we're going to be doing this every year. We also have a plan to launch smaller events on city scales where we maybe seat 40, 50 people with a couple of speakers, but we do the same thing. We make it a little bit of a party at, uh, atmosphere. We make it an educational atmosphere, and we will go. We will bring the message to the cities so that not everybody has to travel uh, across the world to get to us. So we're looking forward to doing that. Hopefully, we'll get a couple of those done next year. So, are there plans for more stuff? You bet your ass there is. There's lots of them. Oh, yeah, and you know, I have to make the joke, just because you got so many death threats the last time you did a conference, uh, how many threats have you gotten so far for this November 1st thing, uh, what's the over-under on uh, getting canceled? <laughs> uh, actually, I've only gotten one death threat. Um, for, yes, I'm a little disappointed. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's like, come on, it's like, come on, don't give up yet, guys. I know you got some fight in you, you you're desperately don't want people from A Voice for Men and other places speaking at your college, do you think you're going to stomp us with one fucking death threat? Come on! <laughs> it's Can't almost Thanksgiving. He wants yes. to be thankful for his threats. And I yes. promise you, I won't do a Starkeesian. I'm not going to get out here and wave the threat around and say, please give me money. I'm just going to acknowledge that you've had your impact on making me have more resolve because we're not going to shut up for anything. We're, uh, again, like I said, we're not doing a Sarkeesian. Sarkeesian pussied out of her own talk from a bullshit threat, and it's so she can raise money off of it. I mean, she's going to do Kickstarters off of this and what have you. But she set everybody up to attend this thing and then turned around and walked out over bullshit. We don't do that. We're going to be at Kennesaw, at, at, at Kennesaw State University on November 1st talking. We're going to be doing our conferences. If I have to, if you force me to, I'll drag out all the death threats from my CMI 14 and repurpose them, and I'll tell people they came from 15. But if you could get us some fresh death threats, would really appreciate that. Uh, it, it really helps. And also, if you're serious about the whole death threats, guys, uh, be nice enough, message Paul in advance, and work out the details to get him a bulletproof vest, just so he lasts a little bit longer and suffers just a little bit longer for you sadistic motherfuckers. Uh, <laughs> in all seriousness, though, I'm really excited to see what's going to come up next. I mean, I had just a ball watching some of the re the, the videos of, of the conference uh, you know, from just a couple of months ago, or six months ago, however long ago it was, it's been a while. I've slept and not slept since then. But that was a lot of fun to watch, so I'm really excited to see what's coming up. And, and I, do. I can't I want believe I'm going to get to... I'm wearing the, uh, the conference t-shirt here. I don't know how well you can see the logo on it. This is from the last conference, and this one has been specially designed. It is spitball proof. <laughs> so awesome. I am, I'm safe from spitballs. I'll be wearing this during the whole talk at Kennesaw. Oh, good. Well, and uh, I can't believe I'm going to even dare to say this to the great Paul Elam, but I want to give you the opportunity to plug every outlet of yours so my audience can check out more of your work, uh, check out any kind of associated works. Where can we find you on this beautiful world that is called the interwebs? The interwebs, we can be found in lots of places. We have a Patreon page that we've just started. There's always, of course, a voiceformen.com. We have um, affiliate sites uh, running a Voice for Men material in eight languages, including Hebrew, Farsi, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, down the line. Uh, so whatever language you speak, in, unless you're, you know, maybe Latvian, we don't have that yet, but we're working on it. We're going to get it all out there. Uh, you can find our material online in eight different languages uh, spread across the world by people who live in those locations. Our site in Farsi is run and managed by a man who lives in Iran. Our site in Hebrew is, Hebrew is run and managed by an MRA in Israel. Uh, these are people on the ground with, with their own facts, their own circumstances, their own news stories from their area. So please 
look at the banners at the top of the site and go give those guys a visit. Uh, also, Sweden's there. Uh, I mean, it's getting to be so many I can't name them all. We have we are on Live 365. We have four hours daily now of radio programming on Live 365. We have a YouTube channel where we're producing hangouts like the one you're watching now at the rate of about four per week. So you get something most weekdays there. We plan to expand that to seven. Um, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on all the social media crap, but in terms of the data and information, check out our affiliate sites, check out a voicefromin.com, the main site, check out the YouTube page, and check out Live 365. There is now thousands and thousands of hours of uh, entertainment and information about what a Voice for Men does and about how we interpret the current zeitgeist of sexual politics and I think a lot of you will find that interesting. And I'll gather a lot of these links from you uh, here over the next, well, 24 hours or so. We'll try to cram as many of them in the description bar below. Uh, we'll, we'll throw it all in there and you know some of the other links and I'll probably create a special page somewhere somewhere on the interwebs of uh, all the books that you recommended when I go back and rewatch this during editing. Uh, but holy shit. Thanks a lot, Paul. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's been just great to have you on on uh, with this with this video, and we're gonna bring more people to your site, all two other people from my audience. Uh, so make sure to go and check we out. Welcome to both of them with open arms. Good. So make sure, guys, to check out avoiceformen.com for more sensible anti-feminazi pro equality content, which is really key. Uh, so pro freedom. We are all about human freedom. Don't exactly. Don't make any yeah. mistake about it. And that comes down to sexual freedom, you know, just personal freedom, 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 freedoms, freedoms, freedom, all that kind of fun shit. So, sadly, guys, next week, not going to be nearly as fun since I likely won't have Mr. Elam on next week because we got to kind of give him a little break and, you know, I got to throw something else somewhere in between so I'm not bashing you guys the same content twice a week in a row. But make sure to like and subscribe to Voluntary Virtues Network here Click that bottom. It's right down there. You know you want to do it. And make sure to subscribe to A Voice for Men's uh, YouTube channel. I will, again, put that link in the description bar below. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. This has been Adam Brown of Liberty Souls Republic High signing out saying peace and love and liberty. And uh, for the love of God, stop beating each other, guys. <laughs>